The message that the Spirit of God has put on my heart is this question that I'm going to ask, has the seven sealed book now been opened or is the seven sealed book now being opened? Now, when we talk about this, we're going to be going to the book of Revelation and we're going to be looking early end of the book in chapter five, because there's a seven sealed scroll that is in the heavens. John saw it a long time ago on the Isle of Patmos in his vision. There are two beliefs about this basically. One is it has not yet been opened, but when it starts to be opened, it is the beginning of the seven year tribulation period. That's the belief that I stand with, but we're gonna go into this deeper. Another belief is that there are certain seals that are slowly being opened gradually and we are now in parts of that book. Before I teach this, let me say that I have very dear friends, many prophetic friends, that we agree on the majority of what we teach. However, there will be some that even may stand in the pulpit that would differ from me. We do not argue, we do not fuss. One of my best friends that I have in all the world as far as a man that I admire, he's post-trib. And uh, I told him, I said, well, we're going to find out real soon, aren't we? <laughs> and, and I don't argue with people. So what I want to do is try to prove why I believe what I believe and show you the scriptures and why we do that. Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, it's the breaking of a scroll in heaven that takes place that actually introduces the events that are to take place during the seven-year tribulation. Now, the important part is the seal number one, two, three, and four. These seals have to be broken. Those four seals represent four different riders on four different colored horses. And these are the ones that some believe are now being broken uh, presently in what we're going through in the world and in the nation. Now, if that is true, if it is true that seal number one has been broken, what that means is that we are in the early part of the seven year tribulation. And I think anyone who's an evangelical teacher or scholar would have to agree that the seals are the clue to the introduction of the seven year tribulation period. So we see certain activity taking place on the earth that's very, very strange. Let me just say this, that take for example, the story of Noah. Noah's flood was universal. It affected the world. Everybody in his family was shut up, locked down, if you please, in an ark. You know how long they were in that ark? One year and two months till they finally came out. COVID came and put us in a lockdown. And literally the world's been under a lockdown for about a year and two months. Now people are beginning to get out. Is anybody tracking with me on this right here? Two events that affected the entire world. Noah's flood and COVID. And yet we see these parallels. And so sometimes when we see these parallels, we have to ask ourselves, how does that relate to something that's found in the book or in the prophetic scripture? So what we're going to do, we're going to review a little bit of both sides and we're going to try to get a definitive answer on this subject of, are there certain seals on the seven seal book that Christ is now opened in heaven that it brings us into the early stages of the tribulation or is it yet something first to come? And the question is this, if the first seal has been broken, without a doubt, the tribulation has begun. If the first seal has not been broken, then we are not yet entered into what is called the tribulation or the seven year period that we know as the tribulation from scripture. Now, most prophetic ministers that I know and the men that will stand on this platform believe several things. Number one, we all believe Jesus is going to return again somewhere in the future. We all agree on that. Number two, we do agree that there will be a tribulation prior to Christ ruling on the earth. That happens before he sets up his kingdom on earth in Revelation chapter 20 for a thousand years. The third thing we all believe is there is a person, not just a spirit, a person called the Antichrist, who will one day, 2 Thessalonians 2, be revealed in his time, who will form a 10 nation confederacy with 10 kings at the very end of the age. And he rules very strongly the last 42 months of this seven year tribulation. We also believe, I think all of us would agree that there will be in the tribulation, what we call cosmic judgments in the sun, the moon, and the stars that are going to affect planet earth. And then there's going to be natural judgments, uh, which are going to also affect planet earth. Now the natural judgments in cosmic judgments, you see very clearly in 
Matthew chapter 24. Now also in Mark 13 and also in Luke 21, Luke 19, these four references give you a lot of details. One writer may add something that the other writer didn't, or one may mention a statement that Jesus made and the others just didn't for some reason mention that. Now, if we look at the prophetic passages, Revelation is divided up into 22 chapters. Now remember, there were not chapters and verses when John wrote it. What happens is when the scene changes, that's when a new chapter begins. And we find out that John sees three views going on at one time. He sees what's happening on the earth. Then he goes and sees things under the earth in something called the bottomless pit, which in the Greek in Revelation 9 is the abusos or the abyss. And he sees activity under the earth. And then the fascinating part is he sees things happening in heaven. And what is so odd is he's on the Isle of Patmos. He's in this vision. He gets caught up in the spirit. And yet he watches on the earth and under under the earth and in heaven from heaven. He's not just on the earth seeing it. He's in the throne room of God watching the angels, watching the temple, watching the seven angels, the seven vials, the seven trumpets. And he looks down and somehow the earth is magnified where he can see the events which are happening on the earth. Now, it all is centered around the throne room scene in chapter four and chapter five. And in that throne room scene, there is something called a seven sealed book. Now in reality, in John's day, this would have been a seven sealed scroll because books did not exist the way we know it till hundreds of years ago. Everything was written and rolled up in a scroll. So it's a seven sealed scroll. And it, it apparently is very large and there's writing inside of it and there's also writing on the outside of it. And so John looks at this book and the question is asked, who is worthy to, to break these seals and open the book thereof? and they sent a search party out to heaven. You mind if I preach an old sermon right here? They sent a search party out to heaven to say, can we find somebody in the heavenlies that's worthy to open up the seven sealed book? And they go over there to Noah. They say, surely Noah was worthy because he obeyed God and saved the world and repopulated. Noah said, well, I'm not worthy because they found me naked and drunk in a tent. So I didn't quite follow through on the after fact. Well, they went over there and they looked at another guy. They said, what about Abraham? Abraham said, you know, I'm a man of faith. I'm the father of the faith. But you got to understand, there was a little bit of time I got into unbelief. I went into Hagar, had a son by the name of Ishmael, and the whole Middle East been messed up ever since. He said, I don't think I'm the one you're looking for. Well, they, they looked at Lot and they definitely shook their head at him and said, no, he ain't the one. <laughs> and then they go to David. They say, David, the, the kingdom was promised to you and Jerusalem was promised to you and the seed was the Messiah that came out of you. He said, you must be the man that's worthy. And David reminded them, no, I had a big moral failure that messed everything up. And like to kill my, my children rose up against me. I lived in rebellion. I had times of rebellion. He said, don't even look at me because there's no way I'm going to touch that book on the right hand of God. And all of heaven, the Bible said there was weeping because no man on earth, nobody under the earth, nobody in heaven was worthy. Then all of a sudden, a voice of an angel said, John, you might as well stop crying because the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy. Ha <laughs> ha. When John looked, he did not see a lion. When John looked, he saw a lamb that was bleeding which makes no sense because is he worthy as the lamb or is he worthy as the lion? And the answer is that because he is the lamb and he redeemed the earth back to God through his blood and he redeemed mankind back through his blood, that's what makes him worthy to open it. But he later comes back as the lion of Judah because the secret of how he becomes the lion is in the book. So he opens it as the lamb knowing when it's over, he'll be the lion. Hallelujah, somebody. That's a good place to praise God. So in the seven sealed book, let's look at uh, Revelation chapter five, verses one and two. Now it says this, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who was worthy to open the scroll and to unloose the seals. So what we're going to do now, instead of reading it, we're going to just give you a basic outline of these individual seals and what they represent. 
The first seal, according to the Bible, is a white horse rider who's given a crown and a bow who goes forth conquering. Now, this is the important one we're going to concentrate on in a moment. Following him is a, another seal. When the second one is broken, a red horse rider comes. He takes peace from the earth and begins to kill individuals and nations, or people, I should say, with a great sword. That word is megas there. So it's, it's, he's given great war authority. The third seal is loosed, and when it's loosed, there is a black horse rider who comes and that horse being a, a dark color uh, the, is, is introducing what we call in the Bible calls the food shortages and the rationing on the earth where a day's uh, bread, a loaf of bread actually costs an entire day's wage. Then uh, the fourth seal is then broken. Then this rider is pale. Now that word pale in the King James should be translated a uh, chloros, I think is the Greek word. And it's actually a pale green. It's a sickly green color. So that should say kind of a pale green horse according to the actual word used. Death and hell follow him. And one third of the people on earth are killed with war or famine and with beast. Now, when the fifth seal is open, it introduces martyrs. And these martyrs are underneath the altar of God in heaven, and they are crying out for their blood to be avenged. And they remain there until others are martyred, and they then are all uh, uh, part of the judgment of the latter part of Revelation is the blood of the martyrs against Mystery Babylon and some of the nations of the earth. The sixth seal is cosmic judgment. There's a major earthquake. The sun becomes dark and the moon turns red and the entire earth is, is in convulsions or in shaking. And of course, Paul said in Hebrews that the entire earth would one day be shaken. So when each seal is broken, now this is important to notice this. If you've noticed it, it's good because it's true. When each seal is broken, there is a negative event happening somewhere either in the heavens that affects the earth or an event happening on the earth that's affecting the population of the earth. And when I've looked at this, it mentions one third are dying with this, one fourth are dying with that. And those numbers sometimes are hard to figure out because if you've got one fourth dying, that leaves 75% of the earth. So is the one third, uh, one third of that number or is it one third of the whole. That would take a whole 30 minutes to discuss. So we'll just have to leave it with just the numbers that are mentioned there. Now, here's the thing I want to share with you. And this is very important. You hear this. The book of Revelation is in a chronological order because John will say, after this I saw, and then the next chapter he'll say, after this I saw. So the reason I'm saying that it is in an order is because if you look at the seals, there is a man coming with a bow conquering. And then you see the following events happening globally, like the war and then the famines and then the earthquakes and the cosmic signs happens after he appears on the world scene. Now we know, now let's just, this is one of the reasons why people are saying, well, the seals have to be broken. Because, why, why do you think they're broken? Well, number one, they're talking about how the locusts hit in Africa and destroyed so much food in Africa. But those locusts come every so many years and they've been doing that every so many years in a cycle. You just haven't seen it on the news as much because social media brings news to you that quick. So it happened seven years before and then seven years before that because they go underground for so many years and then they hatch their eggs and they all come out in a cycle. So just, just to note that it was bad, but yes, that does happen. Number two is the droughts. Now we had a drought in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know if you know this or not, that the mayor in Atlanta a few years ago was going to move the entire city of Atlanta out because Lake Lanier was completely drying up. And finally somebody had enough sense to go to the steps of the Capitol and pray. And God sent rain that day when they started praying. How you like that? It's amazing how God answers prayer when you need it, isn't it? <laughs> if you go to him. So my point is that these type of things have happened in history, but they will happen in intensity in the tribulation. So to answer the question, let's just go back to the original thought. Do, has this any of these seals been opened? The first thing you have to understand is the book of Revelation is in, as I said earlier, chronological order. All right, John sees, he goes into heaven, Revelation 4 and 1. I heard the voice saying, come up hither, and a sound of a trumpet, or sound of a trumpet saying, come up hither. And he said, immediately I was in the spirit and before me stood a throne. So he's in heaven. He sees on the earth and under the earth. But notice this, he starts saying after these things, after the throne room, he goes into a series of, of, of of judgments and he starts doing it when these seals are being broken. All of a sudden he sees this ma major earthquake. All of a sudden he looks over here, he sees this taking place. And then later from once those seals are broken and the seventh angel 
uh, appears at the seventh seal, then it transitions into a whole nother scene, which is important because that scene later leads you to the appearance of Revelation 13, the Antichrist and his 10 kings. You don't see the revelation of the Antichrist as a 10 king leader in the early part of the book of Revelation. You only see it right around chapter 13 is when it really starts kicking in in detail, which leads me to understand why Daniel said that this beast would rule for time, times, and dividing a time. Time is one year, times is two years, dividing a time is six months. And that's why in Revelation, it mentions seven years or one week in the Hebrew in Daniel 9, 27. He will confirm the covenant with many for one seven, one period of seven. Seven years, but later on, when you read in chapter eight and also chapter eleven over to twelve, he starts talking about time, times, and dividing a time. And then in Revelation, John repeats that hundreds of years later in his vision and says, "When this kingdom comes, it rules for forty-two months." 1,260 days, or he uses the phrase from Daniel, time, times, and dividing of time. So it's important to understand that in chapter one, we have to ask ourselves, who is the person in chapter one in that first seal? If it's the Antichrist, then why does he not form his kingdom until mid-trip? What's he doing the first 42 months? Okay, let's look at this because here's what the Lord says. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end say of the Lord, which was and is to come, which was and is to come. Revelation chapter one, verse 19, write the things. Now, this is the Lord speaking to John the apostle on the Isle of Patmos. Write the things that you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter or thereafter. Now, there's three more important points here to point out. He says, there are things that you, you have seen in the past. There are things that are presently you're hearing and seeing, but there's some things you're going to see thereafter. That doesn't just mean thereafter what I'm about to show you. He's saying there are things that are present in this age, but I'm going to show you things in the age or time to come in the future. That's the thereafter there. Now, the reason I point that out is because I want to take the 22 chapters and show you three ways you divide them up. Chapter one is the things which he has seen. And he saw Jesus in that white robe with his eyes like fire and his, his hair as white as snow, his feet like brass. And Jesus is addressing him to tell him, telling him what to do and what's about to happen in this vision that he's about to see. So that's the thing that that's the past. That's what he had seen. Now, the Lord says, now I want you to write what you're seeing presently. Now, what he sees at that moment, right after Christ first talks to him, is he starts seeing in this vision the seven churches of Asia that existed in his day that were going to get a warning or a commendation from Christ and were going to be told that if they could remain faithful, that they were going to overcome and have these great rewards in heaven. You know what? Can I tell you something? Folks, that's not just a promise for seven churches. That's a promise for everybody sitting in this building, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you will be an overcomer, and the Greek word there is really interesting because it means a super overcomer. And how many of you know if you're going to overcome something, you ha there's something to overcome if you're going to overcome. And the Bible tells you what it is. It's the world, it's the flesh, and it's the devil. Sometimes it's the devil. So, let me tell you something. Sometimes the devil targets you for an attack and you never see it coming. Anybody ever been there? And then sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes it's you. Hello. That's a hard one to preach right there, isn't it? Sometimes it's the devil, it's you. And sometimes it's just the, the, the world. It's the pressures of cares of life, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things that try to come in and choke the word and make you unfruitful. So let's go back to this idea of the seals. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went forth conquering into conquer. Now this is the breaking of the first seal. So we have to say, okay, has this seal been open or has it not been open? Now, first of all, there is nobody riding on a white horse right now. <laughs> I mean, there may be some people in the world that have a white horse and there's some Arab kings that have white horses and there's Arab leaders that have white horses because they think the Mahdi, the last leader of Islam, is coming on a white horse and it might be them so they keep a white stallion. That's a fact. Osama bin Laden had a white stallion. Yasser Arafat had a white stallion. Ben... Uh, 
Uh, Saddam Hussein had a white stallion. The Prince of Arabia right now has a white stallion because they have a belief that the Mahdi, the last leader of Islam, will come on a white horse. Okay, keep that in mind. That's, that's an interesting thought when you look at this verse. So, uh, he, okay, so uh, he, uh, he was, he, this person is on a white horse. Now, this is one of those very unusual prophecies because some people in the uh, commentaries three to four, five hundred years ago, when there was not a lot of prophetic preaching, says this was Christ. But I'm going to show you this is not Jesus Christ riding on a white horse. Although in chapter 19 and verse 11, when he comes back as king to rule, he is on a white horse and the armies of heaven followed him on white horses. Y'all better get used to riding horses because you're riding one back. Actually, that's pretty cool. A spirit horse in a spirit body, man. Can you imagine? I don't even want to go there. I, I, I'll, get, I'll get sidetracked and we'll get all crazy here in a little bit. I'll lay on the floor crying. This man is on a white horse in chapter 6 and verse 2. He's not Christ. Here's the difference. This man is riding on earth, but Christ is sitting in heaven. And through the whole book of Revelation, he's in heaven. And in the entire book of Revelation, he's at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So he's not on the earth riding a horse or ruling and reigning, or that's a picture of the church taking over the world. That's somebody's interpretation. This man is appearing on earth with the other horsemen, right? These other horsemen aren't in heaven. They're on earth, right? Doing stuff on earth, war, famine, all that. So this is on earth. So Jesus is in heaven and doesn't come back from there. This is chapter six. He doesn't come back till chapter 19, which is the end of the tribulation. Here's a big one. It has to do with the Greek word for crown, crown or crowns. In the Greek, there's Stephanos for translated at different places in the New Testament. In the Greek, it's translated as crown in the King James, but Stephanos is a particular type of crown. Then there's the diadema or the diadem, which is another kind of crown. Now, now track with me carefully. This is important. The man in chapter six who was on the horse, who has a bow going forth to conquer, has on his head a Stephanos. And this was the crown that was given in the Greek games when you would win the disc throwing or the spear throwing or the wrestling match, that's, it was a wreath. It was a wreath. Sometimes it was just a wreath. Sometimes it was a wreath that had been dipped with gold or it looked like gold uh, ivy, league, uh, ivy leaves, different things. But that's what they gave you. Now, when Christ returns uh, in, in the Bible, it says in Revelation 19 that there are crowns upon his head and it's from the word diadem. Are you ready for this? A diadem is a king's crown. So this one crown means that he's a victor in war. This guy is a warrior. The Antichrist is a military leader. He's taking over nations. He's, he, he, the Bible says he destroys many in the book of Daniel. Uh, the Bible says in Revelation, who can make war against the beast? So that's why he's got the imagery of this particular crown. But when Jesus comes back, baby, he's not just wearing a victor's crown. He's wearing a king's crown. <laughs> King of kings and Lord of lords. He's wearing a king's crown. Greetings, everyone. This is Perry Stone, and I have a great announcement for you. I'm now making available to each of you the International Prophetic Summit, the greatest summit I was ever able to participate in. These are available on CD and DVD albums. There are 11 messages in all by myself, Bill Cloud, Mark Biltz, and also Joel Richardson. Let me just give you the titles you're going to hear. Is the seven sealed book now being opened? The parable of the fig tree and what it means for America. What would Jesus do during this present civil war? A biblical response to aliens and UFOs. I preached a message called the Green New Deal and its economic impact on your family. Another great message that was preached. A word for America from the prophecy of Habakkuk. Another message is called, what time is it? Bill Cloud stunned the audience with a message called Beware the Abab Rav. I preached a message called Answering Tough Apocalyptic Questions That No One Is Answering. Mark Biltz came back and preached a message called Jeremiah is a Prophet for Our Day. I closed the conference out with this message, Should You Prepare for a Pillar Transition? Now I want to say something to you. It is a right now word. They are prophetic. They answer questions. And these are the unedited versions of the message. Now listen to me. On the Manifest Telecast, you only get about 20 to 21 minutes of a message. I still have another 40 minutes to preach. Not only that, but we never show the speaker's messages. And sometimes some of the information they share is for 
certain at-home ears only. It really would be rejected if it was put on social media. So I'm going to tell you how to get this series. If you want to get the CD album, the number is 21 PS CD, and it's for $65 or more donation. If you would like to get the DVDs, and can I suggest to you to get the DVDs because, especially with Mark Biltz, they have PowerPoint pictures. I show you pictures in my messages, and people really seem to enjoy that. But the DVDs are offer number 21 PS DVD for $95. Now, here's how you order. You can call toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD, order that way, or you can contact perrystone.org on the internet, log on and order online, or just send us a check to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. Now remember this, that those checks and those orders go 100% to the Voice of Evangelism Ministry to help keep the manifest program on the air. Now we're living in the greatest prophetic times that there's ever been. There is a clash between two kingdoms taking place. You are only arming yourself properly if you are armed with revelation knowledge and the truth of God's word. May I encourage you, call, go online, or write me right now. God bless you. Thank you for joining me. Many of you have been asking about the prophetic summit that was hosted in the month of June, and we are now making it available. This is your first week on the Manifest Telecast to be able to order the DVDs or the CDs. If I'm not mistaken, there's 11 different messages, five uh, from myself and the others are the speakers that you saw on the advertisement. But I wanna mention something about these. Even when you watch the telecast, you're only getting an edited excerpt. And there are times I'll say, don't put that out there. Uh, and people want to know why we do that. There's numerous reasons that we don't have time to go into detail with, but what we have done with the messages that you're gonna get is get the unedited version and that is available through the offer that we have. So you can get the CDs or DVDs. I would prefer if you can to get the DVDs because some of these guys use PowerPoints and charts and pictures that it's good to see what they're talking about. So either way it's up to you, but we hope you'll get those. Now, we come to, as we come toward the end of the year, we clear our schedule quite a bit because there are a lot of things getting ready to take place through the ministry that I have to plan for, prepare for, getting ready for some, uh, to prepare the land for some new buildings at the Omega Center International Property. And there's many, many things happening and you'll be hearing about those in time to come. We also have been working for quite some time on a project that we've not publicly released. There's only, uh, let's see, about five people that know anything even about this project. And I've been working on it for a year and a half. And we're just waiting for the timing and just praying about releasing this because it's very different from anything I've done in the history of the ministry. And you, we'll see what happens with that. Now, I'm, I wanna announce one place, all of you, that live in Virginia and West Virginia, Williamson Memorial Field House. Most of you know where that is in Williamson uh, Memorial Field House there in Williamson, West Virginia. I'm coming on Saturday night at 6.30, Sunday at 11 and 6, Monday, October 25th at 7. Now that's October 23rd through 25th. So please uh, get to the Field House. I have a word for you. We're gonna have great altar services. We're gonna have a great outpouring of the Spirit of the God. I want the young people to be there, the adults to be there, all ages to be there in all denominations. We welcome you to come to this end of the year meeting in October in West Virginia. See you next week. Stay tuned for the next Manifest program next week.